How to introduce God of Food, Alice Waters, the most important figure in the culinary history of North America, the pillar behind not only the entire California food revolution, but the world's. Alice's belief that cooking should be based on the finest and freshest seasonal ingredients, produced sustainably and locally, has changed how America eats, shops, educates our children, and thinks. Over nearly 40 years, her restaurant Chez Panisse has created a community of local farmers and ranchers and a food economy that is good, clean, and fair. Her edible schoolyard project has created a sea change in how school children learn and are fed in this country, and she is a tireless activist and advocate for school lunch reform, the reason there is a vegetable garden at the White House, and why all of us know how to make a simple, perfect green salad with a nice garlic vinaigrette. Tonight, Alice is joined by Davia Nelson, half of the Peabody Award-winning NPR producing team, The Kitchen Sisters. So please join me in welcoming Alice Waters and Davia Nelson. Welcome, God of food. <laughs> Welcome all. In the Art of Simple Food One, you are demystifying cooking and passing on skills and tools. And in the Art of Simple Food Two, it's gardening and cooking from the garden that's being demystified now and celebrated. I wonder what first put you on the path of gardening? Yeah. I think it really began with taste. Uh, I was looking for food to serve at Chez Penny's at the beginning, and um, a food that tasted like the food I had eaten in France, and uh, I couldn't find it. And uh, so I went out, went out into the world to try to find the farmers that were doing, that were growing the food that we wanted to eat at the restaurant. And, um, and I ended up at the doorsteps of the organic and local farmers. And it's a beautiful thing that happened. I became really good friends. And, and the more I got to know them, the more I realized that they were completely instrumental to the success of Chez Panisse. They really were, they were the, uh, I, I wanted, um, I just wanted to support them in every way I could. And they were the ones that, that really inspired me to plant my backyard garden. And this book is, is really about that. It's, it's, uh, I can't think of anything that's more important right now than taking care of the land. There's not anything. It's where our food comes from. And so that's the, the manifesto of The Art of Simple Food too. The book is dedicated to Bob Kennard. And um, I thought, let's just start with Bob and who he is to Chez Panisse and why this book is his. Oh, Bob, <laughs> I wish you were here. He's really the most fascinating farmer. Uh, I've known him for 28 years now. And I met him uh, because my, my father, uh, way back when, uh, thought that we should have uh, 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 someone who would grow the vegetables and fruits for the restaurant the way we wanted them. And so he offered with my mother to drive around all of California looking for the right person. They went to Davis first and they asked for all the organic growers that were with in an hour or an hour and a half of Chez Panisse. And they narrowed it down to about five people. But they really only thought we would get along with Bob Kennard. <laughs> and uh, when, when they tell the story, and I wish they were here to tell the story of Bob, because my father was 
a kind of gardener, backyard gardener. He had a garden his whole life. And it's probably why I love tomatoes and corn because I grew up in New Jersey and that was so delicious. That was one of the, the real tastes of childhood. And you couldn't kind of mess it up in the kitchen. You got it. My mother was not a good cook. Uh, and, and, and so, but you could just slice the tomatoes and, and boil the corn and eat it on the cob. And, and at that time, it was really good to eat a lot of butter. <laughs> really a lot of butter. In fact, I used to have, my mother was very interested in the health of the family. And, and she thought that we should be having brown bread instead of white bread and not very much sugar and all of that. But fat and protein were really, really uh, 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 something that we, she wanted to sort of get down us every day. And so she would make toast with about a quarter inch of butter on it <laughs> and then three or four slices of bacon. <laughs> and it was just, uh, that's a, a really strong childhood memory is <laughs> eating that, uh, running out the door on my way to school. But um, my father had this idea, and most everybody did in the 50s and the 60s, that you had to have a lawn that was perfectly mowed and it shouldn't have any crabgrass in it. So we had to go around and dig up the crabgrass in the front yard, and it was just manicured in that way. And for him to come to Bob Kennard and to see out there um, what looked to my father to be weeds. And in fact, they were. I mean, in some way, Bob doesn't think of them that way. He thinks of them as sort of companion plants. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but you couldn't see any of the vegetables when, until you got up close, and then Bob would open up the weed door, <laughs> and then down under <laughs> would be these beautiful heads of lettuce. And uh, I guess he thought, well, this is somebody just crazy like everybody at Chez Panisse, <laughs> and they, they, they'll somehow get along well together. And in fact, we did. We did get along. And I just accepted all of Bob's, you know, sort of outrageous statements that his vegetables had 10 times the nutrition than any other vegetable. <laughs> and I said, oh, yes, Bob, I'm sure that's true. But I've really come to understand that it is true. It really is true. But because what he does is he allows the, the, the earth to be everything it can be with all of the, the little bugs and all of the sort of chemical reactions going on there. He wants it to be rich in that way to support the vegetables that are in the ground. And he said it was like, uh, you know, uh, if you are a child and you're, you're in a family, that really cares about you and says wonderful things, is helping you to grow up to be everything you can be. And that's how he thinks of that carrot, that it, he's trying to allow it to be everything a carrot can be. And uh, <laughs> it's not only the tastiest carrot, but it's the best for you. And I, I really, really believe that, and I think we're incredibly lucky to have him as our main stay farmer. And um, he's, he's pretty, pretty remarkable. And we go up and pick up vegetables every day in the summer and every other day in the winter. Uh, and uh, we Can try to serve them the time that to that little system of how you get the vegetables and what you bring to him, just with the compost, it's such oh, a beautiful... Well, I mean, that's, of course, a great thing, is that he wants all of our compost, all of our vegetable compost. And so we have these big buckets in the kitchen, and uh, we take up about seven of vegetable scraps and all different kinds of things that he would like to compost. 
and um, we bring back the vegetables. So it's a very beautiful arrangement. I like that little circle. Um, last year, the Kitchen Sisters collaborated with Alice on, and 90 of her friends and colleagues on an audiobook version of 40 Years of Chez Panisse, The Power of Gathering, the book that Alice wrote about her iconic restaurant and its life and its history. And when Alice asked me to be in conversation with her tonight, she said, oh, well, let's play the audiobook and just listen together. <laughs> <laughs> I think she just wanted us to play the audiobook for that an hour. True. And, true. Uh, but anyway, so we <laughs> thought tonight we'd just pepper some of our conversation with little dips into the audiobook. And um, as we mentioned, The Art of Simple Food is dedicated to Bob Kennard, but um, Bob Kennard is not the only farmer who's had a profound effect on Alice. I think of Alice as someone who follows farmers like some people follow Brad and Angelina. She's just <laughs> following them. Anyway, um, let's go to clip one and dip into the audiobook for a moment and a story from another monumental farmer. Eating is an agricultural act. Wendell Berry. I'm Wendell Berry. I live here on the river below Port Royal, Kentucky. I'm a writer in a small way and a farmer in a small way. I think the first time I met Alice, I was at dinner at Chez Panisse, and Alice came and sat down with us, wearing a hat, if I'm not mistaken, and I didn't know who she was. I didn't know she had a proprietary right to do that. <laughs> it was only later that I knew the part she was playing in this effort for local food, and better food, good food, and good eating. We humans, if we're lucky, spend a lot of time eating. To waste so large a portion of our lives on bad food or bad company is a sort of tragedy. I think all of us know this intuitively, but to teach us to know it explicitly has been the purpose of Alice Waters and Chez Panisse. They do not teach us this by little lectures or signs on the wall, but rather by finding the best available food and surrounding it with the kindnesses of good cooking, good taste in all senses, friendly greeting, and making welcome. On December 1st, 1992, Wallace and Mary Stegner, Jane Vandenberg, Jack Shoemaker, Tanya Berry, and I had the happiness of sitting down together at Chez Panisse to a dinner of the most wholehearted excellence. Of the thousands of meals I've eaten since then, most of them necessarily forgotten, I remember this one in detail. Because of the food, of course, because of the wine, which I believe came from the estimable wine merchant, Kermit Lynch, because of the setting and the company. I have remembered that evening also because it was the last time I saw my friend and teacher, Wallace Stegner, who died the next April. The Stegners, who were getting on in years then and had a driver waiting, left early. The other four of us stayed on, talking with Kermit Lynch and his wife, Gail Scoff, who were at the table next to ours. And so our dinner ended pleasantly and lingeringly, just as it should have. The menu for that evening was wild mushroom tort and winter lettuce, Pacific Coast fish soup with fennel, spit-roasted Keen Summit lamb, Meyer lemon ice cream, and pomegranate granita. Beautiful. <laughs> So Alice, how do you go about writing books? How did you write this book? Well, I was just, I was just thinking about this menu because he, they must have been at the restaurant in sort of late November or beginning December. That's just the kind of menu 
that we would have served pomegranate granita. Pomegranate granita. But uh, uh, every book um, that I have under my name has really been the work of a lot of people, a lot of writers, a lot of cooks from the restaurant, a lot of different people have brought their ideas. Uh, and I think of myself really as a producer of the book. I, I, I think about the ideas that, that we want to express, how we want to do it visually, um, how long the book should be, how big it should be, um, how, uh, what is the sequence of, uh, of the information. And uh, this book that we, we just finished is, has included all the farmers in it as well. And so we have the voices of, of the edible schoolyard gardener. We have voices of, obviously, of Bob Kennard. Uh, but many others who are backyard gardeners. And I, we're trying each time to give you as much information as we know at this moment in time. And um, there's even a glossary at the back of the book that talks about all the terms that, that I think are really, really confusing these days, uh, whether something is grass-fed, whether it's organic, whether it's natural, whether it's um, cage-free, whether it's pasture-raised. I, I think people are confused, and I think it's so important that we're able to ask the right questions when we go, even when we go to the farmer's market, but when we particularly go and shop elsewhere. And when we go to dinner, we need to know what those terms mean. So that's, it's, it's, it's so great that I have a, a kind of small team of uh, Patty Curtin, who's the illustrator in this book, and who's been involved really with every book uh, since, um, well, I guess since number two, which is Pasta, Pizza, and Calzone. And now we're at 14. <laughs> this is the 14th book. I thought it was the 11th. <laughs> Under which three you were forgetting. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, three that I have to do. I think it's pretty extraordinary how the level of detail on planting, on pruning, on cultivation, crop cover, it's 300 recipes, 300 illustrations, but it's the Whole Earth Catalog meets the, <laughs> the Farmer's Almanac meets Joy of Cooking. It's just 400 pages. I wonder if you would um, read just a little bit for us from that. Uh, this, is, um, this is part of the introduction. And I guess it's uh, what I just said, which is my own path to gardening has been through taste. I am forever falling in love with the fantastic range of vegetables available uh, for almost, uh, no, 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 I can't even read my own book. <laughs> learning, learning to discern the subtleties in the varieties of texture and flavor, learning to distinguish an Alberta peach from a sun crest is really a thrill for me. Using hand-selected produce that is still full of life and vitality, just picked from the vine or pulled from the ground, is what makes cooking not just good, but irresistible. Gardening has also taught me empathy for farmers and for farm workers, and respect for the hard work they do, growing our food and taking care of the land. It makes us all remember that Food is precious, and that we are dependent on the land for our survival. It is all about the land. That's the reason I wanted to write this book. One of the most powerful gardening experiences has been watching the children at the edible schoolyard. A kitchen garden planted at the Martin Luther King Jr. Middle School, a public school 
in Berkeley, California. Every time I, time I see them measuring the vegetable beds for their math class or harvesting ancient grains out in the garden for a history class or stealing a taste of a ripe mulberry, I'm reminded that there is nothing more transformational than the experience of being in nature. We've been separated from it. But as soon as we dig our hands into the soil and we watch things grow, as soon as we do, we fall in love effortlessly. We realize that we're part of nature. I've seen this transformation happen in a school full of teenagers. I've seen it happen at a homeless garden in Santa Cruz. And I've seen it happen for the inmates in a jail. This connection to and respect for nature can awaken in all of us. Is that all you want us to be? <laughs> Me to read. <laughs> So oh, quickly, what inspired the Edible Schoolyard? What, what? Well, I have to say um, that it really was this experience that I had uh, when I was called by Catherine Sneed, who was doing a project at the San Francisco County Jail. And she called me up and she asked me if her inmates would grow vegetables on the property around the jail, would I buy them from her? And I said, I, I, I just, I, 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 I <laughs> And uh, uh, well, I was pretty much like that when she said, uh, you know, you need to come out to the jail and meet these gardeners. She called them her students. And I said, I, you know, I just will be happy to buy the vegetables, but I don't want to go to the jail. <laughs> and she said, well, you can't buy the vegetables unless you come to the jail. And, and so I went really, really reluctantly with a couple of friends and um, <laughs> bodyguards. Uh, and we walked through the jail, which was shocking. But we walked out to this seven-acre garden, and it was amazing. And she gathered all of the inmates round, her students round, and she said, well, just, just tell Alice what it's like to work in the garden. And this one kid, you probably heard this story because I say it all the time, but I, it really awakened me uh, to this idea of just transformation. This kid was 21 years old. He had already been in and out of jail. And he said, I shouldn't be saying anything because it's my, my first day in the garden. But he said, it's, it's the best day of my life. And I'm, uh, And really, truly, she had many young guys, particularly young guys, who said that they didn't want to leave the jail because they wanted to continue work in the garden. And so she ended up opening this halfway house garden behind Just Desserts in San Francisco. And then um, I was happily ready to go and uh, meet her there. And it turned out that, that they had a big garden, and what they couldn't sell to restaurants, they took to the farmer's market in San Francisco. They had a stand at the market. And the graduates from that project ended up in the tree corps, never going back to jail. So it's a beautiful, beautiful story. And I thought, well, if you can do it in a jail, you can do it in a middle school. <laughs> So. Jail, a beacon in the night. <laughs> but it, it really makes me think about the, uh, the project that we're doing uh, right now in Sacramento, because the mayor of Sacramento has been involved with a high school there. A uh, thousand kids in this high school, Sac High. And um, he 
really is interested in figuring out how to run a high school so that kids don't drop out. Because every kid who drops out, that they, they go to jail. They end up selling drugs or doing something that gets them in prison. And for every kid who's in prison, it's $85,000 a year. So you just multiply that out. They may be out for a couple of years, but then they're back here. And so when I proposed that, that we needed to work on a curriculum for a high school, and I thought it would be great if the kids could run the whole cafeteria themselves, to run it as a business. Wouldn't it be fantastic? They could do the outreach of it. They could do all the nutrition of it. They could do the budget. They could design the cafeteria themselves, the dining room. They could every day cook all the food, calculate the, you know, to the psychology of figuring out how to please the students. I mean, it just goes on and on. It could take every subject into this experiential place. And um, Kevin Johnson, the mayor, he said, We'll do it. Let's do it. How did you and he find each other? Kevin, do we want to explain who Kevin Johnson is for you? Well, <laughs> former NBA basketball star, now mayor of Sacramento. I just, the thought of you and a basketball player kind of <laughs> the, piecing this well, out. I, well, I think we have a lot in common because he, he was the one who was shortest. And so he was the one who grabbed the ball after the other team put it in, grabbed it, and ran down to the other end of the <laughs> and dunked it. And so I, um, he, he's impatient. He's a fast worker, and uh, we have that in common. And he's, uh, he's determined to, to, to get it in the basket. I mean, he really is focused, and he wants to make Sacramento the greenest place, not just in California or the United States. He wants it the greenest place on the planet. And he invited a whole number of people to help to educate his staff, uh, maybe four or five years ago. And he, he invited Wendell Berry to go, and Eric Schlosser, Michael Pollan went, and he invited me to go. And when I walked in, everybody clapped, oh, 300 of his colleagues were there, and I was so excited to be able to talk about edible education that I just started uh, really uh, weaving this vision for what could happen in Sacramento, sort of right there under the nose of the state governor and all of that. And he said afterwards, we, we're, we, I think we're ready. And they came down and they saw the project in Berkeley uh, and we'd been going up to Sacramento uh, about a year ago. We uh, dedicated the project, and he came up on the stage first, and uh, he said, uh, I, Alice uh, doesn't think I'm radical enough, <laughs> and I think we're going to show her, aren't we? And I just love that. She, he, 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 he really had gathered together Farmers, uh, people that were involved with, uh, with schools all around Sacramento. He had the Secretary of Agriculture in the state was there. He had students giving testimonials. I mean, it was a beautiful uh, press conference in Sacramento. So I'm looking forward to seeing the progress they've made. And it's called Edible Sac High. <laughs> I love that it thing. is. <laughs> Oh, you were recently honored by the Wall Street Journal with their Humanitarian Innovator Award. And in the journal's profile of you, you addressed the question of how to make uh, the Berkeley Martin Luther King Middle School uh, self-sustaining, how not to rely on chronic fundraising, constant fundraising. And you sort of laid out a vision. And um, I wondered if you would mind just reading the vision that you laid out you in the journal. <laughs> Maybe we could do a tortilla making or a, a, a tortilleria 
making organic tortillas. A tortilleria that makes tortillas for schools. I want to do something where we have a message on the package. They're wrapped in the news of the day. I want it next to a print shop so that we can print the paper and then we can wrap the tortillas when they're hot and then we can send them out. It's kind of like our daily bread, our daily news, something that's nourishing, something that kids love, something that is putting Monsanto out of business. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot I said that. <laughs> but I do want to do that. <laughs> it's true. Had you been thinking about that for a while, or did you just come up with it that day? Has that been? <laughs> well, I've been thinking about the idea of wrapping the news, uh, the good news, in, uh, around something that is delicious. And I've thought about it from way back uh, when we were doing a project in Vienna. Uh, I thought that uh, we should do a bakery there and, and, and sort of have um, print every day a kind of message that would go around the bread. And I've been trying to convince people you know, I uh, did a project at Yale, too, and I thought the way to really get the attention of the students would be to offer them something that was really tasty and, and, and again, with a message that came with it. So I have yet to really do this, but I'm getting closer. It seems you're hearkening back to your mother with the butter and the bacon to get you to eat that brown bread. No, but it can't be something. It needs to be something that's nourishing. And I think I moved a little bit from the hot baguette to the whole grain organic tortilla. Because I really do feel like we need to be feeding ourselves and our children whole grains. I, I never thought I would sort of say that coming from from the sort of crazy, you know, whole wheat culture of Berkeley in the 60s. But here I am. And I think it's uh, uh, incredibly tasty because I, uh, the artisans who've been making bread around the Bay Area for years now have really become so good at their trade. And they're making all kinds of breads that we would have never imagined. 15 or 20 years ago. When we were sitting backstage, um, I was asking Alice what she had been doing today, and she was saying she was on KCBS radio, and that they asked her the question that always gets asked, the question that all interviews lead to, which is about the price of organic food and the affordability of this food and who can pay for this food. And, how to spread this as a vision throughout the population. I wonder if you might speak to that. Well, it's a really hard question to address when there's so many sort of food deserts in this country and, and when there's this sort of indoctrination from a fast food culture that, that food should be fast, cheap, and easy. And how do, you, how do you really engage people uh, and, and sort of get them away from the addictions of salt and sugar and, and get them to pay more f for the food that they eat? And um, it's, it's, a very, it's a very difficult... Um, it's a very difficult question to answer simply. Uh, I, I think education is really the best way, or, or to feed people an idea, feed people these ideas. Take this beautiful piece of fruit and just put it out there and have them taste it and bring them into the sort of beauty and the flavor. 
and, and the camaraderie of the circumstances of the table. Uh, but it's very hard to get a population of people who have really been imprisoned. And I think they really have been imprisoned by this fast food culture that wants us to really think of food as, as something uh, that should be the same all of the time, that it should be, uh, there should be, we shouldn't ask questions about where it came from. There's no seasonality in fast food culture. Uh, we, we don't value the people who grow the food or, or, or cook the food in the kitchens. Uh, we just are interested in the, the end product. And, um, and, it's, and it's really feeding a kind of addiction. So, I've, it's the reason that I think we have to begin in kindergarten. And we have to bring children into a positive relationship to food. But the second best way probably is to bring people to the farmer's market. And there you, you meet the farmer. You connect with that person. And you have a conversation, and you see the beauty of all the fruits and vegetables there. And there's kind of a community that is milling around, and it's a different way of shopping. And it's very hard to, to, to do something within a supermarket. You really need to be in another kind of circumstance. And I'm not getting to that question of money, but... Uh, um, um, I, I, well, I am getting to the question of money because yes. I feel like we need to feed every child at school for free. Breakfast, lunch, and an afternoon snack for free. And the, the criteria for that food needs to be good, clean, and fair. We should be buying the food from the farmers who take care of the land for all of us who nourish us. And so that's, that's the proposition on the table. So how do you see that strategically working in local communities? If that idea founds out around the nation, how, how do farms and schools engage one another? Well, I think the way that, um, that, I mean, there is some legislation out there that is trying to arrange for a farm to school uh, program. And I think that's, that's a beginning. But I think we need projects that people can walk into and see that it's really working. And it's the reason that we decided at the 40th birthday of the restaurant to create a website uh, called the Web Edible Schoolyard Project, where we could collect all of the best practices from around the country and around the world for everybody who has a garden in a school, a kitchen in a school, a curriculum in the school, and the people that are tying these ideas together. Because I think in order to really impress on the powers that be, we have to be a strong force. Now we've, without very much effort, we have gathered around 3,000 projects uh, on, on the website in this last year and a half. And so I'm just incredibly hopeful that this is gathering a kind of momentum. But I'm kind of hoping that it's, that we can impress the president of this country and that he can do what Kennedy did back in the 60s around physical education. And that was to cheerlead for the idea of creating a physical education program in the schools that was part of the core curriculum. And we built gymnasiums. We hired teachers. We made a part of the, you know, the everyday life in every school in this country. And that's what we need to do with, with edible education. So. That's the dream.
<laughs> the dream has also expanded to include the Pope. Uh, I never thought I would say Alice Waters and Pope Francis in the same sentence, but in fact, might you tell this group about your project at the Vatican? Uh, well, it's, not, it, it's unrealized yet. But I think you have to talk year, about you guys? really positive things that you want to see happen, even if they aren't happening yet. But I was in, um, I was in Italy at the American Academy in Rome, where I've been working on a project to change the food for the last six years there. And uh, when I was there the, during the first week, and I thought I was going to have a little time to myself, but the Pope called Carlo Petrini on his cell phone. Uh, and Carlo was the head of Slow Food International, for anyone who doesn't know. And uh, Carlo didn't believe it was the Pope, of course. <laughs> And it took him, it took him a little, a little moment. But the, sp uh, the Pope had lived in Piedmont, and he spoke to Carlo immediately in the dialect, and then he knew. And they had a half an hour conversation, and it was recorded uh, in uh, uh, La Repubblica. And I had the great privilege of hearing that sort of simultaneously translated by one of the uh, American correspondents for the New York Times. And it was so beautiful because they had a meeting of the minds and they really believe that all land should be planted to feed people. And all of the Vatican lands the Pope wants to plant in order to feed people. Um, they talked about farmers, uh, subsistence farmers around the world and how they needed to be supported. And it was, it was really moving. And so um, when I heard that the new lay advisory board to the Pope was meeting in a hotel right up the street from the American Academy, I decided to invite them for dinner. And so 20 advisors came to dinner and a cardinal at the academy. And a, a sort of the, the real dedication of the dinner came from one of the Spanish uh, 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 advisors, and these are financial advisors for the Vatican. And he said that in his village in Spain, uh, they had a saying that, that you couldn't grow up to be the person you wanted to be unless you threw yourself down in the earth and covered yourself with, with the soil as a child. And so, I mean, he read this in Spanish, <laughs> and then he translated it. And I thought, this is an amazing thing. This is really an amazing thing, that this is an advisor, a financial advisor from the Pope. And he believes that in the land in this way. And, and, and so Carlo Petrini and I were invited for a little small tour of all the, the different <laughs> garden possibilities uh, at the Vatican. And of course, I chose many. Uh, I'm not, we sadly didn't have an opportunity to meet the Pope. Uh, but we are really uh, involved with a, a, pr a proposal to uh, think about a symbolic garden it might be there and much bigger developments of the papal lands. What so, do you, what do you call the project? What do we call the project? <laughs> well, we were, uh, uh, well, we're just temporarily calling it the Vatican Sustainable Food Project. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the real name. <laughs> and the humble garden. A humble garden. But it's, uh, it's. It's a beautiful thing to, to imagine uh, that, that 
there is somebody, a world leader, who really cares and has people around the world uh, who are listening to him. And it would be my hope that maybe Obama could be in conversation with the Pope. Before we move into... About the food. <laughs> <laughs> yes, about food. Before we move into your questions, um, I know that Alice especially wanted us to hear one section of the audiobook. Alice, why don't you explain this section, Michael Pollan's? Well, I just, I mean, he, he says, he says everything that I would like said about Chez Panisse. So um, I, I can't say anything more than that. Uh, so let's hear that. Here we go. And I'm holding a perfect little piece of fruit just for this purpose. <laughs> so clip four, please. The power of gathering afterward. I arrived at the party that is Chez Panisse fairly late in its history, sometime during its fourth decade. My first meal at the restaurant, upstairs in the cafe, came during the late spring or early summer of 2001. And a decade later, I cannot tell you what I had for dinner. It might have been the salmon, which at the time were still running not far outside the Golden Gate. The only thing I really remember from that meal was not a dish exactly, or at least nothing cooked, though it did appear on the menu. It was, very simply, a bowl of fruit, some peaches. The menu gave the name of the farmer and the variety, neither of which meant anything to me at the time. But figuring those peaches had to be something pretty special to earn a spot on that menu, and to command a price only a dollar or two shy of the profiteroles and galette, I ordered it for dessert, not quite sure whether a plain bowl of fruit on a restaurant menu was best interpreted as an expression of culinary modesty or culinary audacity. What arrived at the table was a small, unpolished bowl of hammered copper set atop a round, hammered copper base. And in that bowl rested two perfect peaches, wreathed in a scatter of equally perfect raspberries. By perfect, I don't just mean perfect looking, like a picture of fruit in a painting or a magazine, though they were that too. Blushing, downy, plumped with juice. No, this was the higher perfection Ralph Waldo Emerson had in mind when he wrote, there are only 10 minutes in the life of a pear when it is perfect to eat. In the case of a peach, that window is probably closer to seven minutes, and in the case of raspberries, maybe five. The wonder of it was that the kitchen had somehow arranged for those peaches and raspberries to land on our table not a moment sooner or later than that narrow interlude of perfection. At the risk of offending the restaurant's many gifted chefs, that unadorned bowl of unimproved fruit strikes me as the essence of Chez Panisse, captures the restaurant's philosophy in a copper bowl. Since the fruit bowl first appeared on the menu in 1991, the presentation of the perfect Suncrest peach or Warren pear has been Alice Waters' wordless way of saying that the true genius behind her food resides in the farmers who grew it and the breeders who bred it. The chef merely celebrates that genius by seizing on the moment of moments and setting it off between the quotation marks of a dish. Which is why the menu goes to the trouble of informing us that the peach is a sun crest, the pear a warren, and the tiny tangerine a kishu. There are times, the kitchen is saying, when no amount of culinary artifice can improve on what nature has already perfected, and it would be folly, hubris, to try. The fruit bowl is also a kind of timepiece, a way of marking the seasonal calendar, which is a rite that has always been central to the restaurant's project. When Churchill's key shoes show up, it must be late December. Swanton's strawberries say May, and the mulberries, the most fleeting fruit of all, signal the start of summer, somewhere around the third week of June. These moments remind us exactly where we are in the round of the year, or rather, where nature is, but try not to miss the moment of the mulberries, a fruit so fragile and ephemeral, it's fallen completely out of commerce, except here on Shattuck Avenue on the very day they arrive. The mulberries, which come from a single tree in Sonoma owned by a man named Hugh Byrne, perhaps best exemplify the restaurant's fierce devotion to the nick of time. Okay, but is it cooking? Some would say no. 
The rap in certain culinary circles is that what Chez Panisse does best more closely resembles inspired shopping than inspired cooking. But I doubt that particular critique carries much of a sting in this particular kitchen. For Alice Waters' genius has been to show us there can be no inspired cooking without inspired shopping, and behind that, inspired farming. It's become a cliche of restaurant menus to mention farms, but Chez Panisse was the first to share bylines, pride of authorship, with the men and women who grow the food, recognizing that many of them are as gifted as any who have passed through the fabled kitchen. So we learn that the Kishu is grown by Jim Churchill and Lisa Brennis in Ojai, the Warren Pear by Farmer Al at Frog Hollow Farm in Brentwood, and the Suncrest Peach by Mas Masamoto down near Fresno. The modesty of the fruit bowl consists in these acknowledgments. Make no mistake, there is a certain audacity in play here too. It is the audacity of a Marcel Duchamp or Andy Warhol Artists who understood that sometimes the best art is found, not made. To pluck something out of the welter of the world and put a frame around it, or in this case, a copper bowl, is a way of making us stop and pay attention. Rightly seen, rightly tasted, the fruit bowl reminds us, the commonplace becomes miraculous. I want a little sugar in my bowl. So, Alice, you're at the near end of two months of book tour, and I'm just wondering, what's, what are you noticing as you've been traveling around with this book and been in dialogue with the public about kitchen gardens and the message of this book? What, what are people uh, wanting to talk to you about? It's, it's just been kind of incredible because there are a lot of young people all across the country that are really, really interested in farming. And they're interested in eating differently and they're thinking differently about their lives. And I think that's one of the most hopeful signs. I mean, one of the most hopeful signs is that people are opening restaurants not to make a fortune, not to make a whole chain of them, but they're opening restaurants as a way of life. And they want it for themselves and for their friends and for their families. And that's a beautiful thing that's happening. Um, I, I uh, certainly when I'm signing in a farmer's market, that's where my best sales are, <laughs> farmer's market. But it's incredible that, it, that there are really almost young children wanting to buy a copy of the book. I mean, you know, like 11, uh, uh, which is, uh, 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 or, or the parents uh, writing the child, wanting to have their children's names in the book, thinking that they are going to take that book and use that book. And uh, that's a beautiful thing. Uh, I think the conversation is endlessly about edible education. I think I couldn't talk, you know, enough about it. Uh, I go and visit gardens in every city that I go to. And, you know, to see the kids that are six years old, um, delighted is, uh, is uh, really, really something. Well, why don't we bring up the lights, turn on the yes. microphones, and why don't you all enter into this conversation with us? I don't. Questions okay. from the audience? Anyone? Oh, coming. I think we're preaching to the sage. <laughs> so your first question will be on your left. Okay. Hi, Alice. Thank you for being here. Um, I think one of the interesting questions beyond just the economic barriers to getting people to eat organically, sustainably, locally is a cultural barrier. And so I used to work at a school in Harlem um, where a lot of our students would eat foods from their culture, um, pastelitos, which are basically fried dough with cheese inside, um, or you know, not necessarily indigenous culture, but 
you know, French fries and wings were like the treat that all of our students wanted from their teachers. And it's very difficult to have a conversation with young students about their choices without having uh, a cultural bias. And so I'm curious, from your perspective, what you would say to those students for whom the you know, slice of bread with butter and bacon is a piece of their home. Well, I have worked um, with a school in New Orleans. And uh, I think that's a place that, that definitely has a rich uh, gastronomic culture, has a past in the past, and also uh, a great, uh, uh, you know, agricultural history as well. And, and a great fast food indoctrination, as we all have had. And so it's, you have to begin with the familiar. And, and that's what we did begin with, uh, red beans and rice. But it was about where are you getting those beans? And where are you getting that rice? And I just know that the real truth of the Edible Schoolyard Project, Edible Education, is that kids need to grow it and cook it. And then they want to eat it. And it doesn't matter what it is. It could be kale. It could be you know, something very unfamiliar to what they have been eating at home and what they're used to. Uh, it's, uh, it's kind of amazing. They, they feel empowered by that. And we're never trying to tell them what to eat. We're just trying to bring them into this other world where they make the choices themselves. But um, I, I think it, it, you know, it, I've just watched what's happening in New Orleans over this last, well, how long has it been? Davia was in New Orleans when this project started. She called me on the telephone right after Katrina. She said, I'm standing next to a, a very wonderful philanthropist who would like to do an edible schoolyard here in New Orleans as a way to rebuild and to care for children. And she said, I'm putting you on the phone with him right now. <laughs> she handed me the phone. And I, I talked to Randy and I said, uh, you know, maybe you should bring the principal and the powers that be up to see the Edible Schoolyard. And that next week, he brought them all up. And they went out in the school and they came back and we had lunch at the restaurant and we talked about it and they said, we're ready to do it. We want to do this project down there. And that's how it began. And they immediately planted the garden. Uh, and they uh, all have ultimately built a kitchen. And I, I, I mean, just, the, I think probably the most amazing thing that's happened is I hear five years later that they've used the FEMA money to build kitchens in the, in the new schools. Now that's amazing, not just any old kitchen, but not just a little burner, but I mean stoves, three of them with fans and, and, and you know, real cooking in, in the kitchens. So they're engaged more quickly than probably anybody else in the country that I have seen in this search for for real ingredients and, and wanting to give this, this beautiful education to their children. And they certainly know about the health consequences of, of not educating their children. And the shocking facts of, you know, one in two is going to get diabetes. One in seven is obese when, and he or she comes to school. In kindergarten, if you can imagine, in kindergarten. So it's it, 
It's about really, I think, the idea of care. And care comes in lots of ways, but putting something beautiful on the table, the kids just get it right away. You know, you don't have to say anything. You don't have to put your arms around them. They just think, somebody has done something for me. They've asked me to come and sit down. And I think the teachers feel that way too. So I always found the most effective way of, of getting this idea across was to bring a big basket and put it on the table. And I still think that. I'm, I, I take the little Kishu tangerines from, uh, from Jim Churchill's farm every year. And we make a little list of people we're trying to convince about something. And I, um, well, I'll probably be sending some to the Vatican this year. <laughs> but I send them every year to senators, to Sotomayor, to Tom Harkin, to Nancy Pelosi, uh, all of the people. And when they get a box of Kishu tangerines, they pay attention to that box, and they, they think about it for a moment. It's the same thing that Michael Pollan was saying about that bowl of fruit. I mean, it's amazing. But nobody offers people things. You know, I think that that's part of this movement that is so incredible, is that now people are having gardens and they're giving things to their neighbors. Or there's a woman down in Oakland who, who I just love her project, where she just goes around and uh, she sees trees that are full of fruit and she leaves a note. Uh, are you going to be picking your fruit or would you like me to pick it and make some jam for you and I'll take some jam and sell it in the market? And people are very happy to have that happen. They don't know how to cook anymore. They don't know how to make things from themselves with even the beautiful edible weeds in the garden, like nettles. I mean, nettles are omnipresent in Northern California. And uh, as soon as we started using them uh, 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 at Chez Panisse, our uh, Bob Kennard just has found a new cash crop. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a, a world of nettles up there. <laughs> Let's take another question. Yep, over here. Hi, Alice. Um, I've really been moved tonight by uh, your words and some of your dreams um, in the same way I am uh, every time I have the privilege of, of dining at Chez Panisse, mainly up in the cafe. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm sitting here trying to metabolize and digest so many of the things you've been talking about tonight, which, I mean, I was just making a little list, you know, religion, the environment, politics, economics, incarceration, culture, education. I mean, you're, you're really speaking about, um, I mean, you're drawing so many things together and, and you said early on um, one of the most important things we could be doing right now is taking care of the land. And um, my mind went to technology and sort of the ways in which, as a culture, technology is sort of taking over in many ways and we're spending more and more time, you know, at our computers or devices and not at the la on the land. And I just was curious about your thoughts about technology uh, and today and, and food and the land, kind of putting that all together. Well, it's uh, very difficult to have a conversation at the table when, when people are uh, on their cell phones there. Uh, and. I, I was talking to a, a kind of an amazing professor of math at the University of California the other, the other day. And um, he considers it a, a, a sign of whether he is really engaging the students 
uh, if they never turned on their cell phones. So he is trying to give a lecture that is so captivating. So really, uh, that, that, you, that you can't, you, you, you can't look away. You can't, you're, you're engaged in it. Now, I mean, he's really an, an inspired teacher and he's got, he's, uh, people are listening to it online, uh, 36,000 every time he gives a lecture. That's going out in the world and in a wonderful way, that is happening. That's one thing I think that we can really be grateful for, that we can hear these lectures online. And we've been doing a class with Michael Pollan at the university called Edible Education. Uh, we've done it for two years, and this spring will be the third year. And we're just grabbing people as they come in town and asking them to, um, to lecture to a class like this. And it's been hugely successful. I mean, Davia and Nikki, the other kitchen sisters, ha have come and done a class. Carla Petrini's been there, Peter Sellers, the, the opera theater director. Uh, we've had, uh, oh my god, I can't even Eric think of all Schlosser. the people. We've got Eric Schlosser, we've had Marion Nessel. But it's Congress. all permanently online, and you can get these lectures. And Bob Kennard's lecture <laughs> is there. And I really urge you to listen to it. I thought it was one of the most amazing lectures. <laughs> I learned so much more about him with that lecture. But I, I, there is some way that we can really communicate globally with people who have valuable information about farming, uh, farming in difficult places, all their secrets and the way that we can, you know, um, connect in terms of where the real food is in a, in a city. I mean, there's nothing I like better than to, to uh, find that app and find out where the organic food is within, you know, a mile of where I'm standing. I mean, there's something incredible about that. Um, it's, it's when, what days the farmer's markets are open. And I do use that uh, for those purposes. But we have to kind of know when to put it down. And then when we aren't using it, we need to really use our hands. And I think a great way to do that is cooking. And not using the blender, but pounding things with a mortar and the pestle. To not uh, to 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 uh, you know make that little fire outside and cook over it, feel the sense, uh, have a sense of the smells and the making of a stock. I mean, for me, it's the most rewarding experience. I just relax into that. It's a rhythm, like making bread. You just doing it, you're rolling it, you're doing it. And uh, it's, you know, not as is, you know, the, what the culture has told us, that it's drudgery and, and somebody else should do that work. We should have the pleasure of not doing that work, when in fact it's the most meaningful work. Did question. I answer that question? <laughs> Our next question up here on your guys' right, up front. Hi, Alex. Uh, thank, thank you for being here. Can I hold this? Sorry. <laughs> um, you know, this might be a follow-up to the first question. I, I grew up in India, and I came here when I was you know, 25 years ago. And one thing that struck me that strikes a lot of people when they come to San Francisco, California, Northern California, is the diversity. And, uh, you know, what goes along with that is the diversity of the food, too. Um, some of this food, actually, by definition, cannot be local. You know, you can't buy necessarily the rice sometimes locally or the spices or the coconut milk, and, you know, and there's some wonderful Thai cuisine, you know, that uses all these ingredients, for example. Uh, what is your philosophy on ethnic cuisine and how often do you actually, you know, indulge? <laughs> Very often. <laughs> <laughs> 
In fact, uh, very often. In fact, I make uh, for myself for for breakfast. I have uh, uh, a little, like a whole wheat little chapati, and I cook it over the fire, and I make a hummus with preserved lemons in it and spread it on, and I drink my Chinese pu'er tea uh, with it. So I'm I'm very interested in in the spices and the ideas from other cultures that are particularly nutritious. Now, I can't get that tea except from China, but I can make that little chapati, and I can make um, my hummus. And no, I can't get some of the spices, but some of them I can make. I can make that little chili powder. Uh, it's what my next book is going to be about, is what I want in my pantry, what gives my food the taste that I really, I really love. And I think that most of the things that we eat should come from nearby where we live, within a certain range. But I go down to Santa Barbara to get some quiches, and I will go north to get some wild mushrooms sometimes. And sometimes that will bring something from back east. But the majority of the food comes from right here. And I think that's, uh, I mean, since, uh, you know, the trade, some things, a little portion of, of our diets uh, can come from other places. I'm not talking about fresh food, of course. I'm talking about things like, like coffee and tea and spices. And I, I don't think I could do without a little coconut milk from time to time. And um, that's how I feel about it. I, I really couldn't. I, I think we can grow a lot of things that we don't think we can grow. Things like lemongrass, things like, actually we have a friend who's going to have a, uh, a, a tea garden up uh, north of Napa Valley. I mean, he's going to raise the plants to, to make tea. And it, he's the owner of the Imperial Tea Court at the farmer's market. So I, I just think we don't know what we can plant. And when I was involved at the uh, uh, project at Yale, uh, they thought that things like artichokes and cardoons were only grown in hot places like the south of France and in California. But it turns out that's not true. They grew them at, uh, uh, there. And in fact, you know, some things that we think are, are you know, that are omnipresent in California, things like tomatoes and eggplants and peppers. I mean, we don't have those in the winter here at all. We don't. Those are all coming from way down in Mexico. Uh, or who knows where they're coming from? China. But uh, uh, we have to find out what really can grow. And they planted uh, 300 varieties of fruits and vegetables at Yale. And they experimented to see which really would, 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 which tomato could withstand a thunderstorm in the summer. Because more and more, it's unpredictable weather. And we have to share that information. So they planted a little uh, 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 yellow tomato that had a tougher skin. And it got ripe very quickly. And, and it could take the first storm. And it was incredibly tasty. And so we kind of miss the humidity for tomatoes in California. I end up liking the really smaller ones and the ones that are warm, you know, in a really warmer place than the Bay Area. Uh, the little early girls that are dry farmed. But these are things that we learn from those farmers. And, and they're really, I think of them, I mean, Carlo Petrini talks about them being the intellectuals of the land. And they're the people who have that knowledge, and they need to pass it on to us so that we can pass it on to the next generation of farmers. And it's very definitely part of, 
a big picture of an edible education curriculum. Thank you. We have time for two more questions. The first one's on your left. Oh, sorry, you're gonna hold it. Okay. Um, I was sitting on the edge of my seat when you were talking about your um, dining with the financial advisors, and I was dying to hear what you prepared, actually. <laughs> well, I, you have to know that I was at the American Academy, and I was in Rome at the beautiful time in September. So we roasted um, these incredible peppers. I'm very jealous that I brought back those seeds and I planted them up in, at Bob Kennard's farm. And they do taste like the ones in Rome. <laughs> and uh, uh, it made me really think about, about how uh, the Italians have been selecting seeds for taste over the years. Not for the quantity that they can grow, but for which one has the best taste and where to plant that. Now, we haven't been doing that selection in this country in that way. I mean, I think there are little corners that have been doing it. But in general, we've been planting for quantity and not for quality and not for that really refined taste. And so uh, these peppers were great. We did fresh, just made that day ricotta cheese and roasted peppers and Little, we cooked in the fireplace at the academy and we grilled the bread and we put the olive oil on the bread. And then the second course was uh, a ravioli on brodo. We made it beautiful, um, a beautiful little stock, uh, chicken stock, and we had these uh, raviolis filled with wild mushrooms. And then the main dish, um, if I recall, <laughs> oh God, um, uh, we did uh, lamb and we rolled it up and tied it and sliced it across rice and we served it with this uh, beautiful um, uh, greens that had been brought from the garden, just wilted all different kinds of wild greens. And um, and then for dessert, I had a friend who ha happened to have a long time ago been a pastry chef at Chez Panisse. And I said, I know you're just visiting Rome for a couple of days. <laughs> 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 but could you come over and make us that apple galette that you used to always make at Chez Panisse? And she came and made an apple galette. So that was the dinner. That was it. Our next question about halfway up on your guys' right. After listening to that beautiful meal, I hate to even ask this question, but what about genetically modified? <laughs> I, the swear words, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, I guess I know too much. Uh, I've uh, been a student of Vandana Shiva's, and I've watched many, many movies about the, the powers that control that, that, um, that seed, that GMO seed. And uh, it's, it's really frightening. I mean, it's, it, it, we don't know enough about it. And I just think that, um, I mean, we learn more and more about it. And I think that when we don't know, we need to oppose this adulteration of food. And I, can, can you remember back when trans fats were something of a little miracle in our foods? And thank goodness they have been uh, legislated against. But I don't know who's going to be doing the you know, the investigation as to whether they really have been added to, a, to fast foods or not. But this is something, something really frightening. And uh, 
we, we need to learn from the people who really, really care about the land and how it's cultivated and the farmers who are, are, are really thinking about diversity, sharing seeds. I mean, the idea of controlling seeds is something immoral, unconscionable. And, uh, you know, the idea of giving seeds to people, what a beautiful thing it is, so they can plant their own. Thank you. Thank you. Now we can either. Now we can either. Thank you all for joining us so very much. And Alice will be signing books. I just think as you're leaving, even Alice is a woman of many manifestos. And uh -oh. this book begins with one. So you let's start leave walking out. on the note of a manifesto. It's, it's a very, walking it's manifesto. Short. It begins, treasure the farmer, nurture the soil, plant wherever you are, learn from nature, cultivate your palate, make your own, eat whole foods, share the harvest, Teach children the art of simple food. That's it. <laughs> Sharing the heart. <laughs>